Paul, one of the prevalent ideas that has been rampant today is that there are innumerable possibilities of which we are only one. Multiverse, modal theories and philosophy, all sorts of things. Very confusing. You've talked about something called a selector principle. Uh, how would that work, to select among all of this stuff? There are really only two what we might call natural states of affairs when we're dealing with these ultimate questions. One is that nothing exists, and the other is that everything exists. Well, I think we can rule out the first one by observation. What does it mean to say that everything exists? Now, in most of the multiverse theories, you don't really claim that everything exists, only that there's an infinite number of universes. But these universes still have all sorts of characteristics. You could imagine different types of universes. Uh, now, Stephen Hawking, I think, has a nice turn of phrase. He says, uh, what is it that breathes fire uh, into the equations that describe uh, this universe and uh, gives them a, a universe to exist? And so uh, I like uh, the analogy of the fire-breathing dragon uh, that somehow uh, selects a particular set of equations and uh, conjures up a universe or breathes fire into them, and, and there you have a universe. Now, that raises the whole issue about, uh, you know, what about the ones that got left out? And it doesn't matter whether we're talking one universe or a multiverse, uh, unless you literally believe that all possible universes, everything that logically can exist, does exist, then some things got left out. And so we would like to know what got left out, what is selected to exist, and what got left out from and, existence. And how do you select it? And, and where did the rule come from yeah. that divides that which actually exists from that which is logically possible, but in fact does not exist? And so you can apply this to multiverses or individual universes uh, equally, unless you believe that literally everything that is logically possible uh, does exist out there somewhere. Uh, then some you have people to, believe that. Now, now, some people will go to that ultimate extreme. Uh, they will say that uh, every conceivable type of universe exists. But you see, even there, there's a problem because uh, they. Most people who will argue that are mathematical physicists. And when you say, well, what do you mean by all possible universes? They mean, well, all possible forms of mathematics will describe a universe somehow. Why stop at mathematics? It's yeah. a prejudice of right. mathematicians. Right. Uh, why not all aesthetically uh, possible universes uh, or all uh, universes that uh, are good or, or, or bad or something of that sort? In other words, we don't have to use mathematics as the criteria. But you so, need a selected actualize a possibility. Right. So once you accept, I think as almost everybody does, that less than everything exists, then there is a problem about the actualizer or the selector mechanism or principle that divides that which exists from that which is logically possible, but which in fact does not exist. And inevitably you ask, well, where does that uh, principle come from? Where does the rule that uh, makes that division, where does it come from? Or why that rule rather than some other? So even when you're pushing into areas like a multiverse and considering all these possibilities, you still come up against this problem. There's got to be a selection principle or a selector or a selector being or something like that uh, at the end of that chain. And so you're still left with a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've even gone one step further in postulating the multiverse. You've talked about the inevitability of what you've called fake universes. Now, is this, is, is this a joke? Are you serious? When I first started thinking about fake universes, it was a joke. I was using it uh, as a sort of reductio ad, ad absurdum of the multiverse argument. And, and the argument goes something like this. Uh, you have to believe that uh, consciousness is something that we could, uh, in principle, simulate artificially. It may not be in a computer, uh, but there may be some sort of physical thing you can make in a lab would be conscious. So. Uh, if you accept that, then of course this conscious being could be subjected to experiences which could be equally artificial. We can imagine simulating a whole world uh, for this being to live in, and a whole community of beings. Uh, and there's plenty of science fiction uh, written on that. Now we can't do that yet, uh, but some people think within a few hundred years we could do it. And if you believe in the multiverse, then of course there are going to be many universes that will have intelligent beings much more advanced than us, and they will surely have made these artificial worlds or fake universes. Uh, and then the, the, the issue is this, that uh, fake universes are much cheaper to make than real ones. Uh, you just simulate them in a computer. You can have an infinite number uh, of simulated worlds uh, just for one computing system. 
And so if you start adding up all of the possible uh, worlds experienced by conscious beings, you soon see uh, that the number of fake ones could easily overtake the number of real ones. And so what does that lead? That leads to the conclusion that we, if we just randomly selected uh, observers, are uh, overwhelmingly likely to live in a fake universe rather than a real universe. Now that's a philosophical argument that has been put uh, by uh, Nick Bostrom in particular from Oxford University as a serious proposition. Uh, and I know some cosmologists who also take that very seriously. Uh, the question is, do I take it seriously? Uh, uh, am I uh, really claiming that this is a fake universe? Well, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I think, it's a fake. <laughs> Incidents will happen to me in daily life uh, that seem like, oh, there's somebody pulling the strings there. You know, this is a, a cosmic joke or something. Uh, uh, but then uh, when I get a little bit more sober, I think, well, uh, you know, this is the path to madness. Uh, and, and so I have to say that I think probably uh, this fake universe argument rather undermines the whole uh, multiverse notion because it's very hard to get away from it. You have to find some reason why uh, creating fake universes is forbidden. And it's very hard to think what that, uh, that, that well, what would it, be. It's what it does is, is it forces us, us to uh, deeply understand each of the possibilities and take them to their logical conclusion, as opposed to stopping where it's convenient. Uh, you, you've made a very good point there, which is that in a lot of science, uh, you, you sort of push the science a bit and you push it and then it seems to get a bit ridiculous and you stop and you say, well, <laughs> right. well you know, that's as far as we should go. But yeah. when you're dealing with ultimate questions like you why is there a the universe, it. why is it put together so ingeniously and so on, you've got to take everything to its ultimate extreme. Yes. And if you say the explanation is a multiverse, okay, let's follow that. What does that lead to? What conclusions do we draw? And if it leads to conclusions like this is a fake universe, so we can't therefore even base the reasoning for the existence of the multiverse on the laws of physics because the laws of physics are fake, well then uh, I, I think that casts doubt on the entire explanation. But I have to say that one reaches uh, similar ridiculous conclusions with almost every explanation that I have heard uh, for why the universe is as it is. They all ultimately, if you push them to the end, lead to a point where you think, well, hang on a moment, can we really <laughs> believe that? And that's what makes it so engrossing. It's, it's inevitably it's, captivating because these are age-old questions. And I guess that in their own way, uh, our ancestors from the remote past went down these same sort of lines of reasoning using their own concepts and got stuck in the same way as we are. And then that leads me to think, well, is there something just about the way that the brain has evolved uh, that means we are doomed to repeat these arguments again and again and again? And people fight wars and have disputes over, uh, you know, whether, whether um, my ultimate explanation is better than your <laughs> ultimate explanation. But um, is it because we necessarily think the way we do? Do we frame concepts like cause and effect and agency and space and time and matter and purpose and all these things? Are these uh, simply categories that we have uh, inherited uh, from biological evolution? And we're stuck with them and we will never resolve these ultimate issues so long as we remain within that conceptual framework. Uh, I sometimes think that if we really could uh, develop artificial intelligence and create a sort of uh, super brain, uh, that could reflect on the nature of existence, it may come up with the answers, uh, but using a conceptual framework that will be completely beyond our comprehension. Now that's depressing. I would like to think that we can actually crack this problem uh, if we're sufficiently imaginative. I would like to think that particularly with physics as our guide, which uh, physics after all uh, is not based on common sense or intuition, it's based uh, to a large extent on uh, abstract mathematical uh, structures and so on, and yet we can make progress. I like to think that if we're clever enough, we can actually grasp the ultimate meaning of existence in terms of concepts that will be unfamiliar from daily life, but nevertheless will be accessible to the human mind. I hope so, I'm an eternal optimist. Certainly the continuing quest is what makes us human. I think we are bound to be curious about the world, and we're bound to not be satisfied with, uh, with answers that just say, well, someone waved a magic wand or there's just some laws that do it or don't think beyond. We're bound to, to say, well, why is that so?